the next panel is entitled uh, Neighborhood Effects on Health. And the three speakers will be Elizabeth Lamont, Milda Saunders, and Stacy Lindau. Um, uh, the first speaker will be uh, Elizabeth Lamont, um, who is a medical oncologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, an associate professor of medicine and healthcare policy uh, at Harvard Medical School. Her main academic endeavor is research in clinical epidemiology and health services research in cancer in the elderly. Um, uh, Elizabeth um, uh, worked with us both in oncology and in ethics some years ago. Today's topic for Elizabeth will be associations between area social factors and healthcare availability. Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Dr. Siegler, um, and thanks to you uh, for, for the opportunity to present today, um, and thanks to the McLeans uh, for the wonderful gift uh, that it has allowed this, this program to develop um, so, so beautifully under Mark's leadership. Um, and uh, also mercifully thank you for the 25 minutes between uh, Dr. Wenberg's talk and mine, because that would have been very difficult to follow directly. <laughs> um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, research um, that our group has been doing recently um, regarding uh, uh, the associations between area social factors and area health care availability in the urban U.S. So by way of motivating this, um, we know from lots of different types of research uh, areas, including work done by uh, Dr. Wenberg's group, and the uh, research that that has spawned throughout the world, um, as well as research in the, quote, neighborhoods and health uh, arena, that where a person lives is associated with the health care they receive and or the outcomes they experience. Um, the, quote, neighborhoods and health research area has shown that associations between area socioeconomic deprivation and unfavorable cancer outcomes um, exist across the full um, continuum in uh, breast and colorectal cancer. So what uh, folks in this research tradition posit is that area social factors lead to patient outcomes. Another possible explanation or an additional explanation is that Area social factors and patient outcome associations are, are perhaps confounded, at least in part, by area health care availability. So to try to get at this issue, we um, asked sort of the following question, is that is, um, uh, are high amounts of area social deprivation associated with low amounts of health care required for the provision of guideline recommended breast and colorectal cancer care. Now, to do this type of research, um, we, we needed to, um, to uh, think about two types of uh, uh, geospatial constructs, and, and those were the social and the healthcare. And so we define social areas um, in a convention that uh, is used in, this, in the neighborhoods and health research as uh, the urban zip code tabulation areas. Um, and these are essentially census tracts that have been transformed um, into uh, uh, spatial units that um, can be described by uh, U.S. Census attributes. So, um, so we define different aspects of these spatial uh, zip code tabulation areas using 2,000 U.S. Census uh, data. Then in terms of healthcare areas, we uh, define those as fully urban um, Dartmouth hospital service areas and uh, this is a work from Dr. Wenberg's group um, that maps determined using empirical data 
um, areas containing on average one to two hospitals um, wherein most uh, Medicare residents received their uh, care. Um, we were then able to characterize these health service areas um, using data from 2000 from the American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, and the Food and Drug Administration. So this is a very sort of crude map um, uh, that shows the square is a hospital service area. Within that are um, six or seven uh, zip code tabulation areas. So the zip code tabulation areas are the places where people live. And then the HSA, the bigger black box, is the area uh, in which uh, the health care that's available to them is uh, contained. And for this study, there were approximately 3,000 zip code tabulation areas and uh, 465 uh, HSAs. So the analytic approach here was really um, very simple. We were asking the simple question, are so attributes of social areas associated with the availability of the type of healthcare needed to provide guideline recommended cancer care for breast and colorectal patients? So um, when we think of regression models, I often think of predictions, that something on the right predicts something on the left. That's really not what this is about. It's looking for purely associations. And so um, on the left are attributes at the social attributes at the zip code tabulation area, and on the right there are healthcare uh, availability uh, and looking strictly for correlations or associations. So um, how did we start? Well, we, 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 I'm a medical oncologist um, who's practiced in urban settings and, um, and have read the literature uh, in uh, social uh, uh, neighborhoods and health research. And so I identified things within the US Census code book that I thought were important. Um, the, the top uh, item uh, is something we were, had uh, substantive interest a priori. So uh, the number of individuals below the poverty line was something we were very interested in, and that was definitely going to be one of our uh, so-called outcome variables or left-hand side variables. Additionally, percent black in a uh, zip code tabulation area was something we were affirmatively interested in. And then the other variables are all things that we, I thought uh, would be potentially important in understanding uh, local uh, 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 social support or lack of um, in an area that would be relevant to, to receipt of cancer care or cancer-related care. Um, we had concerns legitimately that there would be correlations between these, and so we did a factor analysis to try to come up with a composite, uh, one or two composite variables that captured some of this. And so, as you can see, um, there was a high factor loading for a number of variables, um, including patients being below the, or rather, neighborhoods where individuals were below the poverty line, were disabled, where there were a high proportion of female-headed households, high proportion of uh, households where grandparents were taking care of uh, grandchildren, no, houses with no telephones, um, and individuals receiving SSI um, or unemployed. So we were able to create a factor that we called uh, socioeconomic disadvantage. Similarly, uh, we found that foreign born neighborhoods with high amounts of foreign born individuals and neighborhoods with uh, high amounts of linguistically isolated individuals, and that means no one in the household speaks English, um, those were uh, highly correlated and we created a composite variable that we termed uh, ethnic isolation. So our final four variables, so four models, 
uh, uh, were the outcome variables were poverty, percent poverty, percent black, and then the uh, socioeconomic disadvantage and ethnic isolation. Now, uh, this slide shows um, the variables that we were interested in a priori um, in terms of the availability of healthcare needed for the provision of guideline recommended breast and colorectal care across the can cancer continuum. So we divided this um, uh, intuitively into breast and colorectal cancer screening, breast and colorectal cancer treatment, and breast and colorectal post-treatment surveillance. And within each of these um, domains, there are uh, uh, data from different sources uh, that I've mentioned before to try to capture that. And so um, specifically the gastroenterology MDs, the cancer screening MDs, uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, all of those are from the AMA data. Um, the mammogram facilities are from the FDA, and hospital attributes um, are from the AHA data, and that includes general medical surgical hospitals, hospital beds, oncology hospitals, and operating rooms. And you can see here the sort of the mean count of these uh, entities per 100,000 uh, residents in an HSA. Okay, so I, I should have warned you prior to turning this slide on. Um, so these are our results. Um, and what this represents are a series of models. The, uh, this is the outcome variable, percent poverty, for one whole set of models. Percent black is the outcome variable for another set of models here. Uh, socioeconomic deprivation, the third set of models, and uh, ethnic isolation, the fourth. And then what we did was systematically look for associations between um, uh, these social factors and these healthcare availability, uh, the availability of healthcare within the uh, HSA. And um, astoundingly, we found almost no association for any of these things. The starred um, uh, uh, coefficients um, or measures of association are uh, small in magnitude. Um, and if you look closer, what you see um, are essentially U-shaped associations in these areas. So we found that there was a, you know, quote, significant association between cancer screening MDs and area poverty. Well, if you break area poverty into quintiles, what you'll see is that there is not a monotonic relationship between area poverty and uh, decrease in the cancer specialists in the area. Similarly, um, the chart below that shows area deprivation uh, versus GI MDs and cancer screening MDs, again, um, it's not a monotonic decrease as we had predicted or had posited uh, at the time of the uh, study design. So what we can conclude from this is that markers of area social, social, social economic deprivation were not associated with the amount of health care required for provision of guideline recommended breast and colorectal care. Unfavorable breast and colorectal cancer outcomes among in individuals living in impoverished areas may occur despite apparent adequate health care supply. There are certainly many caveats to this statement. One is that this is a purely ecological study that compares attributes of one geography to another. There are no patients at all being studied here. Um, it does not address whether individuals are able to access the available care. So maybe the care is in the neighborhood, maybe it's available, but there's no way for them, the patient to get to the hospital. No one to watch these grandchildren. Um, you know, 
there, there's a vast literature on, on access to care. Um, it also doesn't address the quality of the available care. I mean, what if they have the same number of oncologists, but the ones in the poor neighborhoods aren't board certified? Or um, uh, are, are frankly not good doctors by whatever metric you use. Um, and then the results are limited to cancer-related healthcare supply in the urban US. We decided that it would be wrong to conflate urban and rural and suburban, and so we started with the urban US. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge the great team that I have the privilege of working with um, at HMS, uh, uh, Ulay He and Alan Teslovsky, who are faculty statisticians um, at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, Subhu Subramanian, who's a geographer. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge Jeff Blossom um, from the Harvard GIS group, who uh, helped us with geographic data, and Lori Menides, um, who's part of our lab, who's a um, fantastic programmer um, and, uh, and person all around. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. Our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Milda Saunders, um, who's an instructor in medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago and faculty member of the McLean Center. Um, Milda is currently studying neighborhood characteristics associated with the time on renal transplant waiting lists, and her general research interests concern the social determinants of healthcare disparities. Uh, today, uh, Milda will speak to us about geographic variation in dialysis facility quality. Milda. Hi. So today I'm going to talk about geographic variation in dialysis facility quality. So during our time today, I'll go over some background, talk about my research questions, methods, results, and then conclusions and next steps. So we know that there are important disparities in end-stage renal disease care. African Americans are less likely than whites to be rated as appropriate candidates for transplantation. And of those deemed appropriate, they're less likely to be referred for evaluation or placed on the transplant waiting list. Additionally, African Americans with end-stage renal disease have on average a lower hemodialysis dose and worse anemia management. Now these disparities are important because they translate into important differences in morbidity, mortality, and quality of life. So the question is, are these racial disparities explained in part by differences in dialysis facility quality, and is that determined by location? So we know from the social science literature, the neighborhood plays an important role in education, employment, and income outcomes. However, recent studies have shown um, important um, health outcomes are affected by neighborhood above and beyond individual characteristics. So what do we know about end-stage renal disease care? So we do know that individual differences are important. There are important differences in biology, in patient preferences, and in um, patient behavior. However, even when you take these things into account, we know that there's state and regional variation in dialysis adequacy, that neighborhood poverty and increasing African-American population in a neighborhood is associated with a longer time to transplant wait list. And in unadjusted analyses, facilities that have in predominantly African-American communities have worse mortality outcomes. So this is important because in the US, location is socially mediated. That is, who you are determines where you live. Um, on the yellow map, we can see that African Americans are largely concentrated in urban areas and in, in, in the South. And just to locate you, the darker colors indicate um, counties with higher density of African Americans. Um, and the map, the white map shows that even within these communities, African Americans and whites live separately. As you look at the larger pink uh, dots, those indicate um, larger areas of um, racial segregation. So these geographic differences may lead to important differences in access to care and the quality of care. 
Um, and here we spoke specifically on dialysis facilities because dialysis facilities are an important unit of analysis and site of intervention for patients with end-stage renal disease because most patients um, have both their care um, and their access to care and access to health information at these dialysis facilities. So the research question is, what is the association between dialysis facility, community or neighborhood, regional level factors, and dialysis facility quality? And we'll look at facility characteristics, neighborhood characteristics, and region. So for data, um, we use the um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Dialysis Facility Compare File, which contained information um, from 2009 on all CMS certified dialysis facilities, um, almost 6,000. And we um, linked those um, using zip code to um, 2,000 U.S. Census data for the demographic information. So the three main outcomes were anemia management, that is the percentage of Medicare patients whose anemia was controlled, and that was defined as an anemia between, uh, hemoglobin between 10 and 12. Um, the proportion of patients who had um, appropriate dialysis, um, which is defined as a urea reduction rate um, of greater than 65, and then expected mortality. So uh, the facilities um, expected patient survival um, compared to action pa actual patient survival after adjusting for individual characteristics. Um, the variables were um, facility variables, profit status, the size, and the, whether it was a chain or not. Um, the neighborhood characteristics that were important were the proportion of African Americans and the proportion below poverty, which are um, related but separate um, dimensions. And region, um, there are 18 U.S. Um, renal disease networks, um, and they were collapsed into four geographic regions, south, northeast, midwest, and west. Um, this is the same, these are the same variables in the, um, in an equation. Um, and so these are uh, basic results looking at the universe of um, dialysis facilities. So we can see that fully, of all takers, 72% of patients who receive dialysis have a good hemoglobin. That is within 10 to 12. Um, almost 95% of patients who receive dialysis um, have adequate dialysis. And um, this, the survival was normed. So 10% um, um, have a worse than expected survival in dialysis facilities. Um, and this result, this is the result of ongoing measures, uh, ongoing efforts to improve quality um, in dialysis facilities. And so, you know, for the analysis, um, the, it's unfortunate that we don't have great spread, but it's beneficial for the patients that there's, most patients have um, good outcomes. So this, you don't need to, I just put this up here to prove that it, the analysis is done, but we'll actually um, digest this. Um, so we can see that there are certain things that are important in the analysis. So um, when looking at um, anemia management, chain size, chain, sorry, the size of the dialysis facility, the percentage of African Americans, and southern region were important. Um, so overall, for anemia management, we know that having an increased proportion of African Americans in the neighborhood is associated with worse anemia management, um, but neighborhood poverty did not significantly affect facility anemia outcomes, and facilities in the south um, have worse anemia management. Um, looking at a similar table, except for dialysis adequacy, we can see that um, there are similar um, results that are um, significant. So um, profit status, chain, size, and the percent African American, um, as well as the region, is also important. Um, and so we also conclude that having an increased proportion of African Americans in the neighborhood is associated with worse dialysis adequacy and that the impact is greater um, for lower quality facilities, um, but that neighborhood poverty did not significantly increase um, facility outcomes for dialysis adequacy. But then other variables such as profit status, chain, um, were also important um, and that um, were also important. And then look, our final analysis looked at the outcome of mortality. Um, and we can see similarly um, that uh, profit status, chain size, proportion of African Americans, percent poverty, and then region, so South being the worst, um, were important. And so we see that compared to facilities in the South, Facilities in, the, in all other regions, in the West, the Midwest, and Northeast, 
were um, less likely to report that patient survival was worse than expected. Um, and then also, for each one percentage increase in African Americans in the neighborhood, um, facilities were 3.2 times more likely to report that patient survival was worse. Um, and then also, for each one percentage increase in the proportion um, of the population below poverty, facilities were eight times more likely to report that patient survival was worse than expected. So we conclude from our analysis that location plays an important role in dialysis facility quality. Dialysis facilities in the South are more likely to have higher than expected mortality and worse anemia management. Facilities located in neighborhoods with a higher proportion of African Americans were um, worse on all outcomes. So they had higher mortality, lower dialysis adequacy, and worse anemia management. Um, and, and location and also characteristic specific um, quality initiatives can play an important role in decreasing racial disparities in end stage renal disease quality. So this work has some limitations. So in this particular analysis, we were unable to control for individual characteristics. And we also used zip code, um, specifically zip code tabulation areas, um, were used as a proxy for neighborhood um, with the thought that um, people dialyze close to where they live and that this was a reasonable approximation of access. Um, so our next step, so future work will link individuals within dialysis centers so that we can control for the individual characteristics as well as facility and area. Um, and we'll determine the relative importance of these various levels, individual, facility, neighborhood, and region. And so I want to um, acknowledge my um, research and mentorship team and then um, my funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milda. Um, the, the third speaker on the panel will be Stacy Lindau, an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and geriatrics at the University of Chicago, uh, affiliated with the McLean Center as a faculty member. Um, Stacy's focus uh, of research is on patient care, uh, education, and advocacy relating uh, to the health of age, age, older women and underserved populations. Uh, Dr. Lindau is the director of the program in Integrative Sexual Medicine, a clinic that addresses and studies sexual concerns, problems, and dysfunction for women, many of whom have sexual health concerns caused by cancer or the treatment of cancer. Uh, today, Stacy will, will be speaking to us about empirically defining the intersectoral health system in a high poverty urban area. Stacy Lindau. Good morning. South side of Chicago. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, Mark, thank you. The McLean Center has been uh, a tremendous intellectual um, stimulant and home for me throughout my experience at the University of Chicago. And I want to thank the McLeans as well for their very generous and ongoing support. Um, and it's an honor to participate in the conference today. I always feel I learn much more than I can contribute when I participate. But um, with the prior speakers uh, and the comments of Dr. Wenberg and others, um, I, I'm going to put a little bit of a different spin, I think, both on the notion of health reform and on this uh, new conversation here about uh, how the social environment and the neighborhood environment relates to health. So I'll start with an example from my clinical practice, which Mark mentioned. You know, imagine uh, a, a woman in her uh, 60s who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. She's had mastectomy. She's been treated with aromatase inhibitors to um, reduce her likelihood of having a breast cancer recurrence. She comes to see me because she's having difficulty having sexual intercourse, uh, a symptom that nobody ever mentioned when she was diagnosed or um, initiated on treatments for her breast cancer. She feels depressed. Her relationship is in distress. She's worried her spouse is going to leave her, and if he did, she'd be left really with no uh, income. She needs things like vaginal lubricants to make her sexual functioning better. She probably needs a psychologist, maybe with special uh, expertise in sex therapy to address her sexual relationship. Uh, she would benefit from support from a cancer wellness center. She might need vaginal dilators. Uh, she might need job training if her relationship is, is going to come to an end. And in the first many years of my career here at the University of Chicago have been spent studying sexuality and how it relates to health and health outcomes, 
The clinic where we treat sexual problems in women and girls with cancer was an opportunity to translate the knowledge we uh, discovered by studying sexuality in older ages and in the context of disease. And so finally, a, an opportunity to give back to patients what we've learned through research to improve their health outcomes. And of course, the story I'm telling you begs the question, now that I've been able to perhaps in the clinical setting address the sexuality concerns, explain to the patient why she's having the problem, and even tell her what I think she might be able to do, now we're left with a challenge of where on earth is she going to go to get these services. So the um, the abbreviated title of the talk is What Health System? And it's the question that really my work in sexuality has led me to. And uh, through the, the institution of the Urban Health Initiative at the University of Chicago and some resources that came my way to get involved with the Urban Health Initiative, I've both been able to and have felt a responsibility to begin to work on this particular question. So um, the work I'm going to talk about today happens within the auspices of something called the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. Uh, and it is an important research component of the Urban Health Initiative, although it's only one piece of research that's going on uh, in the context of that initiative. The research takes a community-engaged uh, approach, and so a slide is not big enough, uh, truly, to identify all the players who've been involved in doing this work, but this lists many of the really active collaborators at this point, uh, and they include uh, collaborators and consultants from other campuses, including uh, my friend and good colleague John Skinner from Dartmouth, uh, and Mitch Katz, who's now the uh, head of LA County Health in uh, California. So the charter's been invoked over the last couple of days, and this is the piece of the charter that interests me uh, with respect to this work, the principle of social justice. The medical profession must promote justice in the healthcare system, including the fair distribution of healthcare resources. Physician, physicians should work actively to eliminate discrimination in healthcare, whether based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, or any other social category. And I would argue that place, uh, you know, neighborhood, community is perhaps another social category which relates to these other factors but isn't um, clearly stated here. And the Institute of Medicine and the World Health Organization over the last several years, but most recently um, reiterated in, uh, at the end of last year, are talking about not a public health system, um, but uh, a, a health system, not a health care system, but a health system, and this concept of intersectoral system, which is just a mouthful um, and doesn't resonate well in the community, but it, it's been repeated. Uh, the intersectoral health system comprises the government, public health agencies, and various partners, including communities, the clinical care delivery system, employers and business, the mass media, and academe. This is, this is the new concept uh, from the perspective of the Institute of Medicine and others of the health system. And it is the collective influence and responsibility that all sectors have for creating and sustaining the necessary conditions for health. So it goes beyond the patient-physician interaction, beyond our clinical systems of care, and into this much broader societal responsibility for health. So here's one way of looking at what is the health system on the south side of Chicago. I would argue there's never been a health system on the south side of Chicago, and this is probably true for most communities. You know, when you really ask the question, what is the health system, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling that we don't even really know. The Southside Healthcare Collaborative is a system that actually has been proactively built through the Urban Health Initiative. The work started with uh, now First Lady Michelle Obama, and it's grown into a network of, I hope my mentor Marshall Chin isn't leaving because he's disappointed with me. <laughs> Love you, Marshall. Um, it's a network of, he'll get me back for that for sure, um, a network now of 35 uh, uh, health centers, federally qualified health centers, free clinics, hospitals, functioning on the south side of Chicago, one private physician's office, last I heard, um, sitting around the table regularly to figure out who does what best, how can we work together, how do we best distribute limited resources. And this is a really good start. There's a long way to go, but maybe that's an answer to what's the health system. When we look at the city of Chicago by its 77 community areas, uh, uh, stratifying by the distribution of income in the, in the region, we see with the darkest um, shading being uh, places where 48 to 65 percent of households using imputed 2008 data are living at or below an income of $25,000 a year. That's about the federal poverty line for a family of four. And you, you see quickly that the University of Chicago, like many other urban academic institutions, is surrounded by poverty 
uh, and, and therefore, one might argue, has an interest in, if not a responsibility, to be thinking about how those social conditions relate to the population from which it hires, um, the population it treats, population that, that is our neighbors. Here's a street, a typical street, I would say, in a business district on the south side of Chicago. This comes from a Google um, satellite image, and uh, it's 79th Street on the border between South Shore South Sh and South Chicago. And if you look quickly at this picture, you know, it's daytime. We see a woman walking alone, talking on her cell phone. We see four businesses to the very edge of the picture. You might start to see an empty lot. You see litter on the ground. Um, you don't see any cars parked along the street. You know, what's, what, does this what does this say to us? What does this really um, tell us about place? And if we um, go deeper into some of the data we've been collecting around the community, we can see that there are four kinds of businesses here. A cab company that has a street presence on a, busy, on a business district street but doesn't serve people walking up and down the street necessarily. Pay less submarines, which is closed with a, um, a, a prison-like um, gate. Uh, Balloons Plus, which is open and uh, a professional hair braiding uh, place, which is arguably, you know, maybe of these four, the place that, that uh, given the choices, somebody might walk into. There are many deficit-based models of looking at the way in which re community relates to health. Social disorganization theory has its um, uh, birth, um, uh, we can, can claim its birth, it's a great work at the Chicago School of Economics and has been very, very influential. Uh, we're taking a, maybe, um, what was the term, an unrealistic optimist view or just a dispositional optimist view of urban uh, life and, and health on the, on the south side of Chicago. And we've been starting to conceptualize how it is that place, the built assets, the places that offer goods and services in the community might relate to health. There may be some basic survival functions that our urban places provide, safety features just by virtue of being present and open, being a destination, providing services like access to the internet that can give people um, information for their um, management of their life and, and perhaps safety. And then these other humanities sort of features like history, culture, aesthetic, social interaction that are important for people feeling that they belong. And if you remember Abraham Maslow's um, basic needs, uh, these belonging, solidarity, safety, and basic survival are the three base levels in that pyramid of basic needs, and that's the lens through which we see how place relates to potentially urban health. So I'm going to just very briefly show you some pictures of the methods we've been using to quantify, to directly observe the places and assets in the community, to triangulate against secondary data sets like Dun and Bradstreet, like Google or Yelp, like data sets we could get from FDA about where places and services are that relate specifically to health. With the colleagues at Computation Institute here, we've developed a web-based mapping application, Eugene Sadu really worked on this, that allows people to walk up and down the streets and capture information about assets in, into a smartphone that goes to an internet website. Our scientists are high school students hired from the communities where we're doing this uh, data collection. Uh, there's a whole interesting dimension to that, but uh, you can imagine um, the many good things that come from engaging in the community in this way. And uh, we can start to look at what kinds of services, what places are really there, and we can ask whether the data we have available about places are how accurate they are, and, um, and if they're not accurate, what does that mean for the kinds of analyses that we're doing relating the, the built environment to health outcomes. So we just, I'm interested in geriatrics. We queried senior housing uh, in the community of Grand Boulevard, uh, Chicago. We get a Google map. We see one or two, we get the whole picture of the greater Chicagoland area, and we see one place uh, that is a senior housing facility. We go to Yelp, do the same query, we get a similar picture, one place. And when we look at the data on a website called southsidehealth.org, created by this work, uh, from uh, data collected by high school students working under our training and supervision, we find 12 or 15 places that I, um, appear to look be places where seniors might go for housing. So if we use the, the Google or Yelp data for our analyses about whether um, senior housing relates to other characteristics of the, in, um, of the community, we might get a different result than if we use data directly observed from the community. So let's think quickly about how, uh, what the features are of a health system, remember this intersectoral health system that could help prevent diabetes in our community, again, using the data we're collecting through this, uh, this on the street, feed on the street mapping method. Here are all the clinics in the 12 communities. We've now mapped 13, but this, this shows you data from 12. Fitness centers, looks pretty good, maybe. Remember the, the degree of poverty in these communities. Couple weight loss centers, 
from grocery stores. And now let's look at a health system that could help people manage diabetes. And to me, this is very analogous to the way Elizabeth presented data about screening for cancer, treatment of cancer. Um, we, could, we could plug in cancer here. So there are pharmacies. There are some communities where it's pretty hard to get to a pharmacy, especially if you're an older person, limited mobility. If you need glasses in West Englewood, Englewood, Greater Auburn, Gresham, you've got a long way to go. Likewise with podiatrists. Dentists, there are a few more of those few dialysis centers and some alternative medicine centers. <laughs> so that is the lived experience of people in our communities. God forbid, you're, you, you know, let's say you, you drink the Kool-Aid and you're ready to, to prevent diabetes. You know, good luck finding the places that are going to help you be healthy after you try to sort through uh, the fast food restaurants. So in that same Institute of Medicine report, a comment was made that it is what we do as a society to create the conditions in which people can be healthy that will determine the future of the health of our population. And here's another way of looking at the data I just presented to you. Select diabetes-related assets per 10,000 population in 11 communities. We have more fast food restaurants per 10,000 population than we do all those other things combined. And this is obviously just a select set of assets that might be relevant. And uh, I, I want to point out the sad reality that it appears we have more dialysis centers per 10,000 population than we do weight loss facilities. And that's a problem given the, the amount of fast food. This is so simplistic, it, it's embarrassing, but it, it does really enlighten us to what's, what our um, patients in our population is seeing. We can look, because we're tracking data over time, at gains and losses by sector in the population. This is just over one year. Uh, now, this is, this is a little deceiving, the, the x-axis there is between minus 10% and plus 10% change. We see loss of about four social services centers, loss of four and gain of two outpatient health clinics, and a predominant gain in the fast food industry despite the terrible economy uh, during this time frame. So we are, I really just share with you the, the rationale and the methodology for how we're going about empirically defining the health system in a, on the south side of Chicago, hopefully in a way that translates to other communities. We're, we want to understand what are the assets, how do these places and services relate to health of people living and moving through our communities, and community members have really asked us to drill down on how digital communication technology, te cell phones and internet can be used to either help people get to the assets they need to be healthy or substitute or make up for the fact that they're not there. And I'll end with, um, with this work from uh, Russell Gruen and colleagues. Uh, he's a surgeon, was a Commonwealth fellow when he worked on this, uh, this framework, Model of Physician Responsibility in Relation to Influences on Health. It, it tells the story of moving from individual patient care, access issues which we know are important and which the Accountable Care Act attempts to address, uh, to direct socioeconomic influence, influences. How good is it to give a patient you know, recommendations about where to go if we really have no idea what's available and whether, and whether they can access it, and then issues of quality, et cetera. I think we, it, you know, I am inspired to move into domains of professional aspiration. What are the broad socioeconomic influences and even global health influences? And work is going on by many people in this room in those areas, and we should continue to do it. I think uh, it's a struggle to figure out how to get even beyond the, the doctor-patient relationship. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I look forward to your questions and conversation with the panel. I think we have time for, for a few questions uh, for the panelists. Uh, please, please go to a microphone and um, identify yourself. Uh, Milda, the, you showed independent effects of the chain type and for-profit status, as well as obviously the percent of uh, black population. Is there also a mediating effector in, in this sense? Is there? If you were to take the percent black population out of the the uh, f the um, the equation, mm -hmm. does the effect of the chain size and type go up? Um, and, and, and if so, what is? Can you say a little more about about what are these differences? Or is there certain types of dialysis businesses that tend to sweep into your areas or tend to attract uh, get started in areas where there's more poverty and so on? Yeah. So. Um we know that there, the chain size and profit status are important. So if you had a choice, you would want to go to um, a medium size or large size independent dialysis facility. And um, 
so it's it's not just the chain um, itself they're not all bad but um, I think that there's a larger number of the larger chains in um, urban <coughs> poor areas um, and more importantly they're newer and so the longer you've been at it um, the better you get at it so also the year of establishment if you've been there for a long time, then you get your processes down. And so I think as you come into a community in a new way, then that also has an impact. And so, you know, a lot of these dialysis centers are not new. They've just been bought um, and sold by different um, entities. Thank you. Uh, Stacy. thank you for a very thought-provoking uh, talk. I have a question for you. I want you to pontificate a little bit about why we have this sort of, you know, the fast food restaurants, like the last few slides you, sh you showed up. Do you think that's related to the choices that people have in terms of valuing health versus other things? So exam for example, maybe the society or the community would value being able to work two jobs and not have to cook, right, over having better diabetes outcomes. What is, I know there are multifactorial reasons why we have, you know, desert, uh, you know, food deserts and things like that, but what does this say about the values that the ch society or the community has itself? Has there been work on that, that this is actually, we prioritize it this way, and it's not that we just don't understand that this is not good for our health, but there are other things that we do, and we prioritize other things. Uh, well, I appreciate the question. I think it's somewhat, you know, I could pontificate, but it's important to be evidence-based, and I, it's outside the realm of my expertise to, to fully answer that question uh, at the individual level. Having said that, you know, the market is pretty good at um, responding to demand. I mean, that's what markets do. And the part of the explanation for why there are so many fast food restaurants is because they are uh, sustainable businesses. There's demand and the demand continues. There's a great deal of literature that uh, suggests that um, the success of fast food restaurants in poor communities um, relates to uh, cost, you know, the relative, um, it's cheap to get a meal, it's fast, so time is of essence uh, for people who are, you know, managing jobs that are far, far away and have to take slow transportation to get to and have children to manage at the same time. Um, and there's some, there's some evidence that there may be some biological preferences created by early life exposure to high salt, high sugar, high fat meals that literally may change the biochemistry of people's sensory function, their, their taste and their um, sense of smell and appetite and desire that are you know, influenced by early exposure to these food types. Um, I, I, in so, to some degree, I've, I'm interested in how can we create health in spite of people? In other words, and I think that's where the kind of the aesthetic, the humanities view or the, the humanities angle on how urban areas might, might be healthier. How do we inst instill um, kind of hope and um, different choices by giving people dignity um, through the ways they interact with the built environment? If it's a beautiful place, if the food is a presented in an appealing way, if it's a socially pleasant place to go, and if it meets people's needs, I think there's a better chance of making, of making change at the individual level uh, and certainly pointing fingers or blaming people I don't think is the way to get there. Thank you. I'm going to ask the last question. My question is for Milda and Elizabeth. Um, th this intense data set that Stacy is gathering here on the south side, the South Side Health and Vitality Project, um, in, in light of the kind of work that you're doing on dialysis and, and Elizabeth on cancer, will, would data sets like that from other areas or, or this area itself uh, contribute to advancing the kind of work that, that you've presented and would be interested in doing in the future? That's sort of my question. Uh, either one, please. Um, so with dialysis facilities, I think it's, um, you know, I think Stacey's analysis is interesting to compare dialysis facilities compared to other health and wellness um, entities. I mean, I think that's just an, an interesting um, sort of statement on how the communities are created. Um, luckily for dialysis facilities, because they need to be certified, they don't usually go missing. So they're in the traditional databases. But I think um, what is often lacking is sort of looking at the, um, 
entity that you're interested in sort of mapped onto the broader range of people's experiences. And we know that where people go for their health care is determined not just by um, where the facility is in relation to where they live, but wh what's on the corner. So maybe they can't get to the bus stop to actually get to the Dallas facility because that's just not a safe space. Um, so I do think that those um, sort of more enriched databases can help us answer sure. questions in a way that we wouldn't be able to. Thank you. So, sort of two thoughts uh, to your question, Mark. One is um, uh, that had I had the time, we could have talked more about uh, how to characterize, quote, neighborhoods. And you, one can do it um, through administrative data, looking where people live in terms of their census tract, their zip code, that sort of thing. Um, and certainly if you like large ends, that's a very attractive thing to do. Um, but what Stacy is doing and what others have really pioneered at the University of Chicago are um, determining neighborhoods based on uh, actually what, what residents think and what they think their neighborhood is and what the boundaries are. And so that's really de novo data collection um, and, and mapping of areas that are based probably more socially uh, rather than administratively related to a zip code. Um, so, so that's that's one important dichotomy in the in the the, the neighborhoods and health research. And I think the, what Stacy is doing um, is is much more scientifically much more rigorous, um, and that that's the direction hopefully this research will move in. Um, the second is that that um, this whole issue of accessibility of care. Um, will hopefully be able to be in part answered through this de novo data collection. For example, um, are there bus stops um, uh, near elderly housing? Um, you know, are there pu public phones that work? I mean, um, sort of very basic things that have to do with accessibility of care. Um, and so I think, uh, again, characterizing neighborhoods through um, uh, empirical methods of counting um, facilities, counting uh, uh, travel uh, options, things like that, I think will add um, immeasurably to our understanding of why it would seem that even in the face of adequate amounts of health care, you know, there are these terrible outcomes across the whole cancer continuum. And, and, and what is it? Is it access? And if so, what are I'm sure it's multifactorial, but if it is in part related to access, like wh exactly what is it and what do we need to do to fix it? Thank you. Wonderful panel. Thank you all three very much. Yeah. Um, for those of you um, who are worrying about um, us falling a few minutes behind, we will, we'll put lunch off for about 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, our, next, our next panel uh, is about a book that uh, Jason Carlewish has written called Open Wound. Um, uh, J Jason is a professor of medicine and medical ethics um, and a senior fellow at the Bioethics Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he did his medical uh, studies at Northwestern and trained in internal medicine and geriatrics at Johns Hopkins. Um, his research work has been in bioethics and his clinical practice focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of patients with Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Uh, th this book, uh, written as a novel, is Jason's first novel. It's called Open Wound, The Tragic Obsession of Dr. William Beaumont. And today, Jason's talk will be American Social and Political Norms and the Concept of Professionalism. The two respondents to the talk uh, will, will be Dan Salmezi, uh, from uh, geriatrician at the University of Chicago and the McLean Center, and Allison Winter, professor of history at the University of Chicago. So um, Jason will lead off, and then we'll have our two respondents and uh, a few minutes for uh, a panel. Jason. Yeah, so I did have a few slides that, uh, you know, would prove to you that these were real characters at a real time, or as the publisher insisted, that the novel, say, based on a true story. And I'll talk a bit more about that issue of, you know, why uh, 
why a novel and why not a, a history. Um, and I do, I want to thank Mark Siegler, Dr. Siegler, for inviting me here. And uh, I want to thank the McLean Center as well for, for, for uh, not just supporting this conference, but for supporting me. In fact, I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for the McLean Center. And I don't mean that here talking, but doing what I did uh, in my career. It, it was a key moment at a key time that uh, allowed me to uh, pursue some interests that uh, uh, I had. And uh, I frankly think that without it, I, I'm not sure what I'd be doing, but I don't think I'd be up, I'd, I don't know. <laughs> what ifs that I'd rather not engage in anymore. Three years ago, I, was, uh, I went to Grand Rounds at the University of Pennsylvania, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. And I was deep into trying to finish this novel, uh, kind of caught in some ruts. And the Grand Rounds speaker that day uh, was, uh, uh, sort of helped me finish the book. And the speaker was Jim Wilson, who is a physician and researcher at Penn. And uh, he uh, has had a long-standing research interest in studying how you can manipulate genes to treat diseases that have a genetic basis. And uh, uh, at his, you may recognize his name because Wilson uh, was uh, uh, the lead investigator of cutting-edge research to uh, test of, uh, whether you could insert a virus with a gene into a human uh, who had a very rare genetic disease, and if that virus was, uh, with the genetic manipulation was uptaken, you could almost essentially cure the disease. So if this research worked, Wilson would not simply have cured a uh, uncommon and uh, 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 genetic disorder, but he would have basically opened up a very exciting and promising new field of, of, of therapy, namely gene therapy. Um, but the progress of his experiments came to an abrupt halt in 1999. And I think that's why may, some of you may recognize his name. Uh, in September of 1999, Jesse Gelsinger, an 18-year-old uh, uh, man with uh, uh, this rare genetic disease Wilson was studying, uh, died in a, in a Philadelphia hospital. Um, he was a participant in Wilson's studies. Um, three days earlier, he had been injected with a genetically modified uh, uh, virus. Um, and uh, uh, to try to correct the cause of his disease and died in, in, a, in a fulminant kind of uh, 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 inflammatory reaction three days later. The, the drama created by uh, Jesse Gelsinger's death and the high-tech circumstances of it were soon eclipsed by a larger and even more enthralling story, which was that the nation began to learn how Wilson and his colleagues who were responsible for the study and for Gelsinger's well-being uh, had multiple other commitments than those commitments. They uh, were not simply out to cure people with OTC deficiency, this rare disorder, and advanced gene therapy, but they also had commitments to their careers and to investments in their science. They had patents on the gene uh, viral vector they were testing. They had corporate interests in the inventions that they held. Some accused that they were quite literally banking on their results. In the lecture that Wilson was giving some decade later after the death of Gelsinger was a lecture he periodically gives. Uh, it's his reflections on what led up to that failed study, what he's learned from it, and uh, how the experience has changed him. It's a very moving lecture, and I was privileged to attend it. And during the lecture, Wilson asked himself out loud, what motivated me as a physician? And what was the impact of this motivation on the decisions I made on a daily basis? This is his ethic. And his immediate answer was, well, to help people with rare and lethal diseases. But he admitted that that sort of standard answer was really not a complete answer. And he went on to say this. He said, we would be fooling ourselves if that was the only force that motivated us. We are in a tremendously competitive profession. To succeed, you have to do certain things. The academic treadmill. It's hard to get off once you get on. You need to succeed. There's this vague view of recognition, and with recognition comes these tangible things, such as papers. You need these to compete successfully. The competition plays a major role in how we behave. In how we behave. And then he concluded with this reflection, which I'll read to you. He said, these subjects deserve better, a protocol that's not tainted with conflict of interest and not tainted with our own professional agenda. It was that moment when I heard that quote that I took that quote and also a quote from uh, de Tocqueville that America was a spectacle for which the world had not been prepared by the history of the past to frame the start of, of Open Wound, the tragic obsession of Dr. William Beaumont. Because I think what Wilson was saying, and I'm sorry that he had to say it with the context that got him to that realization, is that the idea of scientists as dispassionate actors who work only for a decent wage 
and, uh, and, and peer recognition and are out to make the world a better place and cure diseases is an ideal of the modern progressive age, but it is frankly a myth. And the reality is that while cases such as Gelsinger are extreme, fortunately research participants rarely die, that what that case revealed and his reflections on his case is that scientists are in fact all too human. Their professional agenda is all too human. And that's why I wrote this book and why I decided to write it as a novel. So, the story of Wilma, William Beaumont and his tragic obsession begins long ago, June 6, 1822. Uh, he, uh, America at the time was more unsettled than settled. Uh, the United States reached to about the Mississippi River, and many felt, uh, especially residents of the East Coast, that's about as far as we need to go. The river's a natural boundary. We can sort of stop there and let the buffalo and the antelope roam. The Native Americans who we were pushing further westward will be there, and we'll just trade with Europe, and that'll all be good. So much for that. The story takes place, it really took place, on an island that may be familiar to many of you as a hot vacation site and apparently a leading site of the fudge industry, which is Mackinac Island. Uh, which is way up on the straits where Lake Huron and uh, uh, Lake uh, uh, Michigan meet. Um, and uh, at the time, this city, for example, didn't exist. It was a fort and, a, uh, and some shacks, uh, but uh, 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 Chicago was just a, a future idea, idea. Beaumont was there as an assistant surgeon uh, in the United States Army. Uh, he was the only surgeon on this island that was a major uh, hub of fur trapping trade at the time. And uh, on that mo morning, on June, uh, the, the, a young man, Alexis Saint-Martin, who was a French-Canadian uh, uh, and uh, 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 an indentured servant to the American Fur Company, uh, was in the American Fur Company's supply store. And um, it's a, the structure is still there. You can go visit it. It's probably much reworked from its original shape. Um, but the American Fur Company at the time in America was like the GE, Ford, Apple, or whatever. It was the biggest company in, in America. Uh, and in fact, its owner was John Jacob Astor uh, of the Astor family of New York, who gave us the public library and other things. Uh, one of the great, by the way, elder abuse scandals of the 20th century, Lady uh, uh, Mrs. Astor's uh, estate being robbed by her children. But uh, uh, Jacob Astor was a self-made man. He used to be a baker in Germany and immigrated to America, and the rest is history. He became America, one of America's first multimillionaires. Uh, Alexis was in the store, and someone set down a shotgun loaded for duck, and the shotgun, uh, I guess, uh, discharged accidentally and blew his side off uh, right around here. And uh, Alexis, of course, uh, would survive this shooting uh, courtesy of the administrations of Dr. Beaumont. Beaumont had been a surgeon in the War of 1812, and, and frankly had learned to take care of gunshot wounds really well. There's no better training than to take care of sick people, and he took care of a lot of gunshot wounds. The wound, which um, uh, uh, I could show you some slides because it usually gets the crowd kind of uh, a little stirred up. Uh, I can often see when I show these slides. But what happened was that uh, Alexis would survive, but his, the hole ultimately that would uh, exist uh, would not, never heal over. Uh, so that he had a, 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 it was the size of an American Eagle dollar, uh, as, as Beaumont described it, a hole that if he sort of coughed or strained his stomach, the inner lining of his stomach would bloom out and Beaumont would describe it as a large blooming rose. And you could just shove it back in. And if he ate, all the food would come out, so he had to keep a lint plug in the hole to keep it from food coming out. And um, uh, 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 this hole, Beaumont realized, would become a window to study gastric digestion. And, and Beaumont, over time, uh, would transform Alexis into sort of a living physiology laboratory. Um, you could put food in, you could take food out, you put on a little silk string and shove it through the hole, time it, take it out, look what happened, time it, take it out. He figured, he discovered that if you took a rubber tube and shoved it into the hole and sort of moved it around, the, the, he would start to stimulate the production of what he didn't realize at the time was gastric acid, which he called a gastric juice and that would trickle out into a little jar, and he would save it and put food in that and whatnot. Um, and uh, uh, he, he began uh, uh, these, uh, uh, over time, these studies of gastric digestion. And, and, and that's the history um, in, a, in a nutshell. And we read it and we, uh, uh, to get the truth, uh, excuse me, to get the facts, but I would argue that we read uh, fiction for the truth. So I was, just to give you a, this is a physician who was apprentice trained, worked in the army, never did any research. And I imagined how after his patient had recovered from this horrible wound by his very miraculous, uh, very skilled care, 
I imagined to myself the day that he, that this happened. By early October, three months after the shooting, summer was fast vanishing. Days were shorter, but the light brighter, as if the sun were burning more intensely in a futile gesture to stall the onset of winter. The agents from the American Fur Company and the American soldiers and their officers prepared Mackinac Island for the interminable months of frozen isolation. The brigades of voyagers and Indians dismantled their tent and lean-to village along the lake shore and embarked in their bateau and canoe and paddled north into Canada or south into Michigan. The white children returned to school. Alexis's days had settled into a routine which began when Beaumont stepped into the infirmary of the ramshackle hospital carrying his basket of medical supplies. Good morning, Alexis. He smiled as he watched Alexis yawn and rub the mount of his palms against his eyes. Good evening, mon Dr. Beaumont, Alexis laughed. Good, good morning, morning. His accented English ran hard on the D's, swallowed the R's. Still sore from his wound, Alexis lay flat upon his back, gathered his nightshirt under his armpits, then folded over the thin blanket to reveal his abdomen swaddled with the bandages Beaumont had applied the previous evening. Beaumont took care to wrap the bandages tightly around Alexis's torso, from his chest to his navel. The bandages themselves revealed the progress of the wound's healing. It had been at least four weeks since the outer layer showed the ruddy stain of discharge. As usual, Alexis gazed straight up into the ceiling, waiting patiently, blinking. Madame Beaumont, she's well? She's well, quite well. Alexis nodded and smiled. Little Sarah? Very well, thank you. They, they wish you well too, Alexis. Now please, if you could just lie still, still as usual. Beside Alexis's cot, Beaumont placed the simple brown wicker basket that held bandage rolls, a surgeon's pocket kit, and a bottle of diluted acid he had gathered from the supply room. He sat on the edge of the bed just inches from Alexis. The bed frame creaked, as it always did. Beaumont took out his surgeon's kit from the basket, unrolled it on the mattress, took up his jackknife, and set to work, methodically cutting away the dressings. He folded away the sliced bandages to reveal a wad of carefully packed bandages the size of a tea saucer. The skin around the wound was still inflamed, but no longer grossly purple. He began to peel away the lint bandage, and with that packing now revealed the pink, rugated puckering of the inner lining of the stomach, blooming through the wound like some large rose. Alexis coughed, and the bloom expanded, glistening and covered with limpid fluid, uniformly spreading over the whole surface and trickling to the edges of the wound. Beaumont gazed upon this display for some moments, then applied three fingers of gentle pressure to the center of the bloom, and it slowly depressed into the blackness of the space that was Alexis's stomach. An amazing sight each time he witnessed it. Beaumont folded a clean lint bandage into a square, soaked this with muriatic acid, and began to wipe the edges of the wound and the track where Alexis once had a fifth rib. In time, Beaumont thought, all in time, this wound will close and I will have a case worthy of the medical reporter. Alexis coughed again. A bit of meat, chewed but unmistakably meat, popped out from the aperture and onto the bandages, and a slow trickle of gastric juice flowed out from the lower margin of the wound. Beaumont picked up the meat and inspected it. He, instructed Alexis to, he had instructed Alexis to keep an empty stomach to prevent just such soiling of the wound during morning dressing changes. Now he held in his hand the evidence that Alexis had stolen a meal sometime in the early morning hours. Beaumont had seen food in just this state before. There was nothing unique about this morning and this piece of meat. As he held the partly digested piece between his thumb and forefinger and gazed at the wound, two facts came together as one for him. He felt as he had the morning some ten years past when he first stepped into his assigned hospital tent at the camp in Plattsburgh, New York, or when taking calls as an apprentice to Dr. Chandler. It was the same sense in his guts and rush of blood to his head as when he was a boy jumping from the barn rafters into a hay pile. For weeks, he had observed that the hole into Alexis' stomach gave off no odor or other evidence of putrefaction. Perhaps the cavity, he thought, did not work as it he had been taught, like a barrel to churn and ferment food, but in some other, and it seemed, more elegant manner. The stomach was perhaps not as he had, and many of his colleagues had thought it to be, some grinding bag or fermenting vat. It was some manner of chemistry, perhaps, like an alchemist trick that made flesh disappear. On this morning, an idea kindled not reasons ordered plans, but desire laid to take, make the taker mad. Alexis was his patient, of course, but he could be something else, too. Beaumont could not conjure the proper word, but whatever the word on this morning, he realized that this man, this wound, was his window to 
discovery, wondrous discoveries, discoveries of the secrets of digestion and diet that would rival the work of the famous Parisian physicians. There wasn't another proper doctor within hundreds of miles, a situation conducive not only to a steady and good income, but now also the discovery of this treasure. It was his, and it was simply waiting to be explored and written into a book. It was like the vast western lands that President Jefferson purchased and Captain Lewis and Clark charted, and from which the American Fur Company extracted profits. The unknown was waiting to be known. And once known, rewards would follow. Promotion to surgeons secured, election to medical societies. He would erase the humility of his medical training as an apprentice and the condescension of the medical college graduates. His reputation would be solid and preserved for posthumous time. He shook his head like a drinker and who'd swallowed more than his fill. I'm a doctor, not a scientist, he thought. This was work he had no sense of how to do, of where to begin or how to finish before the wound fully healed and sealed its secrets? Or how would he convince his wife, Deborah, of the worth of the sacrifice of time and money? And if it was ever done, whatever it really was, he had no idea how to sell it. The idea was swallowed bait, a folly even. God damn. Alexis grew concerned. What is it? Is there a problem, a type of what you call what you call pains? His smile had vanished. Beaumont tried to calm his patient. He began to quickly wrap the bandages into a wad. No, nothing's wrong, Alexis, nothing at all. You're doing well, truly, all is well. He reached out and embraced Alexis. He smiled as best he could. You are the very model of recovery. Alexis wrinkled his eyebrows, then relaxed and returned his doctor's smile like a moon reflecting the light of its sun, but ignorant of the nature of the fire that kindled that illuminating light. He spoke in unusually clear English. No, my Dr. Beaumont. I am your miracle. Well, his miracle would um, subject himself to hundreds of experiments uh, uh, at the hands of William Beaumont, repetitive, ultimately, and redundant experiments. And ultimately, Beaumont would uh, write these up as a book called Experiments and Observations of the Gastric Juice and the Physiology of Digestion, a, a truly winner of a title that the publishers would definitely want to market. The, um, at the time that Beaumont practiced medicine and pursued his amateur science, the theories of digestion included that it could be a grinding vat or a fermenting bag, and there was a little bit of hints that maybe it was chemical. And uh, we do give Beaumont credit for discovering and sealing up the science that it's a chem digestion had a, uh, had a substantial chemical process. Beaumont himself, lacking any training in chemistry and unable to collaborate with anyone because he was fearful of losing his claim to fame and money, um, was never able to collaborate with a proper chemist to discover that. He tried, but it always ended in sort of a bad uh, collaborative relationship. But there's no question, you know, Beaumont would, uh, uh, he got kind of uh, obsessional and he would, he would put, he would chronicle all the various foods he would put into Alexis's stomach, oysters cooked, baked, and raw, um, and then he would time how long it took to cook oysters cooked, baked, and raw and write that time down. He would put the oysters in a vial of juice under Alexis's arm to reproduce the heat the caloric qualities of, of digestion, time that. Of course, he never gave you the weights of any of those things, so the whole time to digest issue was sort of not worth the data because he didn't tell you how much it weighed, so you know how much oysters take how long. There were some of those mistakes that even at the time many critics picked up on that uh, this hardworking clinician kind of overstepped his reach, but this hardworking clinician uh, was determined to uh, become a famous physician, well paid for his book and well rewarded for it. Open wound is about transformations, from patient to subject to employee to object, from physician to scientist to entrepreneur. It's about how people succeed in making these transformations and also how they fail. At the time that Beaumont lived, the US was just exiting a very rough adolescence. By sheer luck, we managed to get out of the War of 1812 without losing to the British and so we um, had a sort of a country now that was ours to work on, and Europe had no interest in us anymore. They were exhausted by the Napoleonic Wars. Slavery was legal. America was engaged in a relentless westward expansion uh, and was doing so by destroying the Native American. We would break treaties even before we could make the treaties. Um, and the, we were destroying the native land of buffalo and antelope and other uh, uh, creatures. Open wound, I know, therefore, seems like it's set in a time long past. It's sort of the frontier, crazy times, more, more, more frontier than settled land. Category of who you were could determine what you got in life. If you were a pauper or a slave or a woman, there were various things you just couldn't do. Couldn't vote, couldn't own property. You could be sold. 
Um, and yet I think that the story of this very ambitious, hardworking guy from humble roots, uh, Dr. William Beaumont, and his relentless and untiring pluck is really a story of a most modern man. He really wanted to be somebody. Who was William Beaumont? Let's read you this. When William Beaumont was a boy, no more than five, an uncle rode in from somewhere out west on a roan horse, outfitted with saddlebags that bore that man's initials hammered in gold. He carried a brace of flintlock pistols whose barrels were etched with mythical sea creatures, their smoky burls of high-polished walnut. On the pinky of his right hand, he wore a golden ring set with a green emerald the size of that nail, of the nail of that same digit, and he was dressed in a soft coat that matched that stone. He sat before the fire steeped in drink, pipe smoke swirling around his head, and told his wide-eyed nephews of their ancestor, William de Beaumont, who was named Earl of Warwick by William the Conqueror. There would have been land to go with such a title, lads, land and indentured servants, but centuries later, we descendants, you and me, lads, are scattered hither and yon, toiling fallow earth, searching for our fortune. He pointed at each of the boys with the amber stem of his pipe. He licked his dry lips. By the morn, his father, rich in pride but poor in land and cash, called his brother a fop and a fool and ordered him never to cross his threshold. This brother's name was never again uttered, and in time it was forgotten. He told his son William that he was no namesake to any kith or kin, that there's nothing to a name but words. A name's just a name, son, not some titular conveyance of talent or wealth and position. Our lives are as free men in a free nation of democratic laws that rewards industry and virtue. Each man has to make it on his own, make his own name in this republic. Each man has to begin the world anew. Who was William Beaumont? He was a common American man, determined to do something extraordinary and to be rewarded from it. So in these times now, when Jim Wilson, my colleague, myself and my other colleagues in medical research live, our frontier is a bit of a different frontier. It's the bios, the commodification of everyday life, genes, proteins, and other biomarkers of disease. Scientists like myself and my colleagues do not simply discover new knowledge, but we can actually own it. Uh, if we wish, and our institutions encourage us to do this. Patents, licenses, trade secrets are part of the discovery and translation of scientific knowledge. The academic industrial complex pursues scientific research as a means to generate capital. Plans for the dissemination of grant results include how you're going to commodify or monetize those results. The template CV at my institution includes a line for peer-reviewed papers, chapters, invited talks, and also patents. I can put my patents, if I had them, on my CV as part of my research work. Several major universities reward annually a select group of faculty who have achieved research excellence, major universities. And the criteria for this award of research excellence is bringing in a million dollars or more of direct costs and grant funding. Research excellence. Did William Beaumont have a fault? As I was researching him, going to the archives, reading the books, about him, I came across a line in one of his notebooks where he condemned novel reading as lovesick trash and those who read novels as enjoying, seeking enjoyment beneath the level of a rational being, which guarantees that if you were alive today, you wouldn't read my book. And the context around his comment is very understandable. Novels were a very recent art form at around the late 17, early 1800s. And like most new forms of art, tend to be viewed as transgressive and disruptive of the social and moral order. And so books that were very popular at the time included Samuel Richardson's book, Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. And uh, 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 it was one of the bestsellers of the age. And it depicted a character as ordinary as Pamela Andrews, a servant girl who struggled to establish a fair and just relationship with her master, who was lusting after her. Um, the idea of Virtue Rewarded, at that time, I think he meant he wanted to screw her, and she wasn't going to let him screw her. And that's what the book's about. And to be sure, it's a title in a book that has the softest of soft porn as its theme, but yet I think also it has a more ennobling point as well, which is the empathy that one feels for a servant girl in an era when servants could be owned, like property, and under an indenture, or even as a slave. And I think that's what books do, they, they, that she's no longer the other, but she's a person, just like you and me. So... So, and so too was William Beaumont in some sense. William Beaumont was a person who told his wife, Deborah, 
Deborah, I know life here on Mackinac Island is difficult. I know that. It is for me as well, and that's precisely why we need to help Alexis. My career has always been only halfway to what I want, to what I deserve. When I first enlisted in the Army during the war, it was to be as a surgeon or even as an assistant surgeon, but they made me a mere surgeon's mate. When the fighting ended, I deserved promotion to assistant surgeon, and yet despite all my labors and successes, they would only offer me the same commission as a mate. At the Battle of York, I operated side by side with the surgeons, just as one of them. When other doctors fled the army, I remained, even in the winter, along the Niagara frontier. I have a letter signed by General Makem and 17 other officers that testifies to my bravery. But eight years later, after hard work and private practice, when I sought to re-enlist in the army, they would not grant me the commission as a surgeon, but only as an assistant surgeon. And do you know why I have suffered these repeated indignities upon my talent and my character? She shook her head slowly. No. Because I, a New England farmer's son, who sit out in this world with no more than my wits and my ambition, I was trained not in a medical college, but as an apprentice bound by an indenture, much like these voyagers who gather beaver pelts for Ramsey Crooks. That has vexed my career since the days the Third Medical Society of Vermont granted me a license. That training has been my blessing, and it has been my curse. But here, with this case, with Alexis, I finally have something to show, and to show definitively my talents as a surgeon and a physician. I saved his life, I nurtured him to health, and now I can close the wound. I will have managed entirely on my own as an unprecedented case. When Dr. Lovell reads this account of the wound, he will surely see the rightness of my promotion. And when colleagues read the case, they will surely grant me the recognition due to me, now and forever. The circumstances of my training will be of no consideration in the judgment of my character and the merit of my skill. This is America, not some aristocracy. A man's judged for what he's achieved, not from whence he came. He stopped speaking abruptly. A sob welled within his chest. Deborah stared at her husband. I had never known of this, William. Beaumont composed himself. I know. I always thought I shouldn't burden you with something I felt unable to change. Because until now, until now, because now I can change it. I know what Jim Wilson says, what he means when he says we would be fooling ourselves if helping patients was the only force that motivated us. I applaud his honesty. I truly do. I mean, I think of William Beaumont as a guy who, like, went to the state school because he couldn't have the money to go to the good school, you know, who maybe even had to do his medical school overseas, <laughs> whatever. And yet he really wanted to make it. And he did. And I suppose I have to give, if I had to give myself and my other ambitious colleagues one bit of advice, it would be this. It would be to read a few novels, or at least near novels, such as good biographies, or novels based on a true story. <laughs> stories about people who you study. Stories about the lives that are your source of fame and profit. And also stories of you and your all-too-human ways. Thank you. That's my remarks and my book. Thanks, uh, uh, Jason, for uh, first for writing uh, Open Wound and second for giving me the uh, opportunity to, uh, to comment on it. Um, we don't have a lot of time in 10 minutes to, uh, to say anything, so I'm going to basically make three, uh, three points. I'm going to talk about um, the novel as a method for doing bioethics, um, uh, Open Wound as a novel, um, uh, and then some of the ethical issues that I think are raised in the novel. So, so first about the novel as method um, for doing bioethics. Um, well, the first thing to say about it is that it is novel. Um, not, uh, not a lot of folks are doing that, particularly in the 21st uh, century. Um, I guess it places it within the broader realm of what people have uh, begun to call narrative um, uh, ethics. Uh, the insistence, which is true, that, we, um, that ethics is not simply about uh, principles, but about character, affect, motive, intention, moral psychology. Um, and it's ironic, but fiction um, is often the best way of, uh, of actually getting to understand some of those th uh, aspects of, of ethics. Um, not abstract, but real people and real situations are what ethics is ultimately um, about. And even the thickest kind of legal description or case description you get in a, uh, in a bioethics textbook won't do that. Um, 
the question, I guess, is whether um, you know the exploration of character um, is only done through a story. Um, I, I would take it as one way, a good way, uh, but not the only way, and that the way I would look at it is that something like a novel helps us, particularly if it's in dialogue with something like virtue ethics, which is also um, exploring some of these issues, or um, uh, philosophical moral psychology, which is also exploring some of these issues. Um, but it's very helpful that way in putting flesh and blood um, on, these, uh, on these principles. Second, um, about uh, open wound as a novel. Um, well, um, you know, it's actually a highly readable novel. Um, and it, I think it's plausible if you read it, particularly as, a, as I do as a physician. And uh, it's actually written in short chapters for physicians with limited attention spans, which is very good. So I, I read a lot of it uh, precepting in clinic, actually, between cases. You could uh, do a chapter. Um, it's, he, he's not the first person to use a, a, a novel this way to talk about you know, the ambitions of, uh, of physicians and scientists. Um, um, and and um, it's no dishonor to Dr. Karlowish that um, you know, he's uh, got to sort of match people like Goethe's Dr. Faustus, Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein, Hawthorne, uh, the, uh, the birthmark. Um, um, so that's the, you know, there are precedents uh, uh, for this. Um, but I hope, uh, but it's, it's very good, and I hope Dr. Karlowish is flattered to have his name even mentioned in that kind of company. Um, um, and there are also, I think, some delightful touches, if you get, get a chance to read it, um, things that could only be written by a physician writing a, a novel. Um, and here's one that really struck me, um, because uh, if you're a clinician, particularly an internist, um, this is one quote. Her legs, and he's talking about Beaumont examining his pregnant wife who's got edema. Quote, her legs had swollen so that Beaumont could pit his thumb into the soft white flesh about her ankles as if it were dough. If you're a clinician, you know that feeling, um, and almost nobody else in the world does, actually. Um, so that's, that's nice. Um, so sometimes, um, however, um, doing it as a, as a novel, as uh, telling a story like this, is also a little bit frustrating. Um, um, I'm a physician, I want the facts, I want the historical facts, and you know, while it's based on a true story, I'm always frustrated, what's the true story here historically, and what's the novel part? Um, maybe like Dr. Beaumont, I have my own tendencies to think of it as lovesick trash, and want the, want the facts. Um, but I think maybe as um, Dr. Karlowish said, maybe that's part of his aim, is to make us as clinicians who are so intensely interested in the facts, uh, read a couple of lovesick novels for our own good. And then uh, third, just about some of the ethical issues that are raised uh, within uh, the novel. Um, and I think there are actually many of them, um, and you can probably use something like this for, uh, for teaching in the, in the same way that uh, I think um, uh, Leon Cass and the uh, President's Council in their book, Being Human, was a compilation of stories and myths um, that can help to be a springboard for teaching about various ethical issues. So here are some of the ones that I think um, I found, just jotting them down, came uh, through the novel. Um, there's first the ethics of altruism and professional duty, um, how much risk we're willing to take for um, our uh, patients in order to help them. Um, Beaumont has to disobey his superiors um, in order to treat. Uh, Alexis uh, Saint-Martin. Um, second, in particular, in that section of the novel, there are questions about divided loyalties because um, Dr. Beaumont is a military uh, physician, so he's actually disobeying um, the, uh, uh, his superiors um, in the military rank uh, when he's treating uh, his patient. Um, and um, he also, there's also a little section in which he's giving testimony against a soldier who's accused of malingering, um, a very interesting divided loyalty uh, issue for uh, military physicians. Um, a third um, issue is treatment of the undocumented. Uh, Saint-Martin was a foreigner. Um, he was a French-Canadian trapper, um, and there were questions raised about whether it was permissible for Dr. Beaumont to treat him. Questions raised that have become very much part of the conference thus far about the costs of care. Um, who was going to pay 
for uh, the treatment of uh, Alexis and Martin? Um, what were the limits of charity within the community in which he lived? Um, next, fifth, um, uh, very much part of the novel, I think, is this question of the moral psychology of medical research. How much is about helping humankind? Um, how much is about pure, disinterested, intellectual curiosity, whether or not it helps anybody? Um, how much is it, of it is about the lure of prestige? How much of it is about financial gain? Um, our motives, I think, as Dr. Carlewish suggested, um, are often mixed, but what's the right balance of those? Um, if we are human beings struggling with these, um, that will be best for us as human beings, best for, uh, for patients, best for human progress. Um, sixth, some questions about informed consent for research. Um, there's this wonderful contract that actually Saint Martin uh, has to sign um, with um, um, evidence of mixed motive, motives on the part of the investigator. And of course, the appeal is to the common good when Alexis Saint Martin signs his contract. And then, last, an issue about paying subjects for research. Um, uh, there's um, uh, while uh, Saint Martin was, um, in fact, initially an indentured servant, he almost becomes an indentured servant of Beaumont during this uh, research. Um, and questions are raised about um, exploitation of uh, research subjects and the role of payment in doing that as well. Now, um, the last uh, issue is a bigger social one that I think Dr. Carlowish also alluded to, um, and he, he has um, a, uh, Vice President uh, Martin Van Buren say this on page 210, quote, progress in science, as in commerce, is essential to the, ex the success of our great American experiment, unquote. I take it that uh, Dr. Carlowish uh, thinks it is a true description of the American ethos. Um, is it true? How much does it affect us in the various university medical centers where we work. And if it is true, what are we to make of it morally? Well, a good novel um, brings us to think about such questions. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's a real pleasure to have the chance to um, comment on this book, which I found absolutely fascinating. And I'm especially intrigued, as Dan was, by the question that hangs over it of what kind of knowledge can come from a work of historical fiction. So the story introduces us to an army doctor on Mackinac Island called to help the victim of a shooting accident. And at first, their relationship is straightforwardly clinical, with Beaumont struggling to keep his patients safe and alive. And then Saint Martin improves, but the fistula remains open, and Beaumont sees this as an extraordinary opportunity for discovery. The very category of research subject doesn't yet exist, and part of the point, I take it, is that we can step into the shoes of someone grappling with research ethics questions before those questions have ever been formally articulated. Beaumont was trained by apprenticeship the norm at this time, though not the course of the elite who would take European tours and learn anatomy by dissection in the great Paris hospitals. There weren't very many American medical schools. In Vermont, the first was founded in 1822, some time after Beaumont left, and University of Michigan founded its medical school in 1850. So this story is not Sinclair Lewis's Aerosmith or A.J. Cronin's The Citadel, novels that famously deal with ethical ambiguities of research, the medical research careers a century later. By then, medicine was science and heavily institutionalized. In these stories, each ethical solution, redemption of a sort, amounts to an individualist departure from an institution. Lewis's Martin Aerosmith retreats to his personal lab in the Vermont woods. Cronin's Andrew Manson retreats to his personal clinic in a provincial town. In early 19th century America, ethical solutions were one, less one-dimensional, and of course, as you've heard, Beaumont's story is not one of redemption. Rural doctors worked in relative isolation and had little sources of professional support or solidarity, though it is clear that they longed for them. In 1823, the year after Beaumont met Saint-Martin, 
The Lancet coined the term general practitioner and urged that medicine recognize the value of non-specialists. The next decade, the BMA and, the, and then later the AMA were founded, but not by the medical elite in urban centers, but by um, ordinary workaday doctors in the country. In the novel, Beaumont hopes that discovery will be his ticket into the world of elite medical society and the recognition um, that he couldn't get any other way. Prevailing attitudes about medical knowledge making were on his side. Doctors then subscribed to the idea of rational medicine in which intelligent doctors could trust their own common sense and their own observations to learn from their patients and treat them. And in the experimental sciences, the contribution of some individual significant observation had long been a way to get uh, fellowship in a core group. But in medicine, this thinking had to do with clinical treatment. There didn't yet exist a convention for turning a patient into, well, into something that Beaumont tellingly has no name for, even as he's coming up with the idea. He struggles to define his changing relationship with Saint Martin, characterizing it variously as master and servant, victor and prize, owner and owned, inventor and machine. When I began reading, I assumed that the tragic obsession in the title was going to be an intellectual one a monomaniacal need to unlock the secrets of digestion. But the obsession, of course, as you've realized, is with success. Discovery is only a means to an end. In the language of the 19th century, there were those who worked with their heads and others who worked with their hands. Within the professions, there were strata too, and Beaumont wanted to move from a world of mere practice, the hand workers of medicine, to the select world of the discoverers. Now to the broader question on my mind, the tension between the kinds of truths that can be had from fictional exploration and from historical analysis. I'm a historian. I might even be the only historian in the room. And in my, um, it's, it's in my interest, therefore, to be a bit skeptical of the idea that history only gives us facts, whereas fiction delivers the truth. But it is an appropriate gesture for a book that is clearly searching for a way imaginatively to get at a truth about a life whose documentary remains are fragmentary and a truth that would probably be elusive even if we had a really good paper trail. I think that a remark that Dr. Carlo Ish makes a little later in his author's note that if there's to be justice in the world, it will be done by people who see the power that fiction gives to empathy really evokes what the book is trying to accomplish, namely to get readers to experience this power. It's a twist on a familiar argument that fiction allows readers vicariously to experience an actor's intention and challenges. One might say fiction makes it possible to reflect more holistically, like Dan was saying, to get at a more encompassing truth. But if so, there are some costs. Fiction is an indirect way to make an argument because the very holism makes the argument less clear. Should we conclude that Beaumont's professional ambitions trumped his clinical duties? Should be re we be reflecting on the ethical issues presented by a passive experiment, one that just presented itself to Beaumont? Or is this a case study in the archaeology of the research subject? I suspect it's all of these, and there may be value in this ambiguity because medical ethics cases come with so many overlapping issues. So when you put flesh on the bones, as it were, of a, of a case in the way that you don't get when you have like a, a two-page story, um, there's more of an opportunity to reflect on these multifaceted issues. If part of the goal is historical, to explore decision-making at the dawn of medical modernity, then there are similar costs. Does one try to evoke the differences in how people express themselves, or do you minimize those differences to help the reader greater identify with the characters? Carlewish, I think, tends to emphasize differences in context and practice, and emphasize similarities in motivations and value categories. So for instance, when Beaumont wants Saint Martin to remain with him as he's recovering, after he's recovered a bit, a preacher objects that there are appropriate limits to beneficence. This term has an ancient pedigree meaning a kindly act in general, but I bet that most of you have used it if you've ever used it in the specific context of medical ethics issues. The idea that a physician might be guided by beneficence when trying to act in the best interests of his patient, even if this might be done without consultation or overriding the patient's wishes. Medical readers will think of this context, this ethics context, when they read the term on page 57, if you've got the book, particularly because the issue hangs over the whole story of the relationship between Beaumont and Saint-Martin. 
Maybe this tiny example helps tease apart the difference in the truths that one can get from history and fiction. Dr. Carlowish writes that Beaumont is a modern man in his, in his ambitions to leverage discovery, to move up in the world, that he's like the contemporary researchers that he talked about in his presentation. But I wonder if there's more to it than that. Otherwise, why write about a figure from the past or from this particular period if what we learn about it is that in a world where discovery can benefit you, people are going to be ambitious? Is this a special moment when ambition can be realized as never before? This doesn't tally with the grain of the story, partly because Beaumont is not really good at it, and partly because people have been finding treasures in special qualities of other people and lugging them around the people for centuries. In this sense, the moral of the story is timeless. But I think another answer is that this is supposed to encourage doctors to reflect on behaving wisely and not indulging tragic obsessions, not deceiving themselves about acting according to beneficence when sometimes they're just being self-serving. If so, the value of choosing a case from this specific period when the institutions of modern medical research and practice were just taking shape is that it casts a different kind of ethical light from Aerosmith or The Citadel or their many modern successors. In those novels, the ethics of the um, relationship between practitioner and institution are center stage. In the 1820s, the ethics of the relationship between practitioner and an emerging category of subject are to the fore because the institutions of research were not yet stable. And the point is that those ethical questions didn't go away historically when the institutions of modern medicine solidified, even though they became less conventionally visible. That's one reason that I think it really valuable to look at historical episodes like this one, maybe even particularly this one, and perhaps to do so through fiction. We journey into the past to get a different perspective on the present. Uh, we're going to take about uh, three or four minutes for a couple of questions. Um, I, I, I thought uh, Jason's introduction to the book and the two commentaries were spectacular. Um, I, I hope they'll be made available to you because uh, I, I thought they were deeply insightful. Um, good, questions. I mean, when, when, when the president is sort of rebuking yeah. Beaumont, you, you have him saying, and I just want to see if this is true, he cites, he cites the San Martin case to say, Assistant Surgeon Beaumont is to be especially singled out for making an experiment upon his patient of more than doubtful propriety in the relations of a medical advisor to his patient. Yeah, that was him about uh, what he had done to Griswold, not to Sam. Oh, Martin. that was, yeah. I got yeah. it, okay. But yeah, good. that's lifted from, that's. But that is true. That, lifted from the archives, yeah. Good. Like, a lot of the letters I just transcribed, the opening preface of the book is a letter that Beaumont wrote to Alexis begging him to come to him and so, later, long after Alexis fled him. And I just transcribed that letter. It was this sort of love letter almost that he wrote. It's really kinky, actually. Ryan Nash from UAB. Thank you all for three excellent presentations. I look forward to reading the book. I haven't read it, but I uh, look forward to it. Um, a comment that you made, Jason, in, in your presentation just made me curious. So this is just a curiosity question. One of the seeming critiques of Beaumont was uh, that this ambition of having a successful book and moving up to a new level of uh, met, into the new level of medical elite possibly led him to overstep his bounds and take advantage of his subject. Right. I wonder, assuming that you're not opposed to having um, making money or being having prestige from your book. Um, if this parallel, parallelism between you and Beaumont <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, um, it informed the respect that you gave your subject. Yeah, no, I, if you don't think I see the irony between what I'm doing and what that guy did. <laughs> but your patient's already dead. Yeah, he's dead, and actually I tried to find if there's a book. I, I agree with you, I agree with you, and it, and it, it, did, it did humble me, trust me. That, or there's, this is, it's very, uh, it's been a very interesting process of sort of using his story to make a story that I want you all to read, you know, and it, I agree with you. I completely agree, and um, I, I think the fact I'll, I just I think I'm glad I at least feel that I really am. I did see if there were any Beaumonts alive that I could trace to the family because I thought, God, could I get sued? And as far as I can tell, they were they were a rags to riches because they became very wealthy in St. Louis. He earned a lot of money as a celebrity physician to Rags family. They definitely sort of faded from uh, existence. 
By, con by contrast, the Griswold family is still alive and well in, <laughs> in Connecticut, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. He did come from a famous Connecticut family, Lieutenant Griswold, I traced him down. Well, if, if there are no more questions, I, I you. urge you to look at the book. Uh, there are some, I think, that we may still have on sale out front. Um, I, I, let, let's try to gather, I know we won't quite make it, at 1.30, follow the crowd to the Green Lounge where box lunches will be available of many different sorts. And again, uh, remember to come to the party tonight, okay?